Many of them also don't have parents. There's a huge alcohol and drug problem there, and a lot of them have to sleep and find shelter in like the most horrible places ever. The weather there drops to minus four degrees at night, and some of these kids have to find shelter in the graves and in up up tr up some trees and just the most obscure places that they have to find shelter in. The Alalai takes these kids in, gives them a choice if they want to come and change their life around, to go away from prostitution, from drugs, like just life on the streets. And they equip them with so many skills. Obviously they go to school, but what we love about this Alalai was that they teach them music, they teach them how to bake bread, they teach them carpentry skills, they teach them how to sew, all these vocational skills. And they also really look into the kids as individuals. One of the kids called Christian, they saw him like jumping around the place, doing all these acrobatic moves. So they thought, oh, we'll send him to gymnastic classes. And he's only like really young, like eight years old or something. And he won, the, he won like second place. And I think that's great because like, you're not just seeing them as one big hole not just seeing them as orphans, but you're really looking to them as individuals and as percent potential as a person. I think the biggest challenge about this project was none of us were actually Bolivian and none of us had been outside because we couldn't afford to go. We were still completing our architectural studies. Correspondents send us a lot of the plans and pictures of the site. It's still not as good as actually being there to see and meet the people. So that was one of the main issues. Um, in terms of on-site, we went on-site with a design that we designed for before. It was a carpentry workshop. And yeah, we tried to integrate in a lot of things that we thought would benefit them in that sense. Yep. This time, we got a bunch of volunteers, which was really good because it was more of a team effort. We had to learn how to manage a team as well. There's 10 of us, all from different countries. We look like the United Nations. But um, it was so interesting to do that. But at the same time, it was a huge step, a huge learning curve for us to learn how to do things on our own, in a way. And we used everyone's potential. We had a property developer. We had a couple of architecture students, one architect, fashion designer, engineer. So we tried to use everyone's skills to the potential but um, a lot of things went quite slowly because in these countries things arrived late there were days where we didn't have water we were digging foundations and pouring foundations were covered in concrete and cement and there wasn't water so we couldn't even shower for three days but and then you have to look back and just laugh at it I think the thing that we found in Bolivia was um we, we, we were testing a very a very different design. It wasn't a design that is um, that was kind of locally seen and it seemed a little bit different and a little bit quirky. We were still using the same materials that they would use. We used brick, we used you know concrete, we used it in the same sort of way, but um, but just assembled it different. And so I think the workers that that we kind of worked with initially and maybe the architects that came and saw the design initially were slightly perplexed. Um, so, we, so I think one thing that we definitely learned, as Sue had mentioned, was communication at an early stage um, and the necessity of going out to this country early on to explain the idea and bounce back ideas and stuff. Um, I think at this next stage we're really going to have a lot more involvement with the children in the design, which is, which is exciting. We haven't finished the building and me and Jalisa are actually going out in a couple of days time. And when you see this video, we'll, we will be in Bolivia at, this, at, at that time to finish the building. And this will be the stage where we're finishing, putting on the final touches of the building, trying to get the community involved as much as possible. Um, um, yeah, all these problems and stuff and the things and the challenges, how do you think that it's prepared us for our next stage? Well, I think it's taught us how to be very, very prepared and to do a lot of research and you can never be prepared enough. Mm. Like, I really want to do our next project in Malaysia. For me, that's the next stage. So when I come to Malaysia, we're going to be so well prepared. And yeah, everything's like, I don't think we'll ever get things 100% right ever. And because it's so interesting working in different places, it's never the same in one country to the other. And it's just learning how to be adept like adaptable, adaptable. Yeah. and like taking advice from the local people as well like it was such a big thing because like 
we are taught a certain way in architecture school, like, we've seen, like, architects, like, big girl, like, oh, I'm an architect, oh, I'm Zaha Hadid or something. But it's totally not the same in humanitarian architecture. No, it? there is no yeah. space for ego no. in, in humanitarian architecture, which I yeah. think is good because you're there really to, to serve the yeah. other person. and they, the local people... They know so much They know more, more than you. So... So that's why I really learned. It's a very humbling experience. Homeless, yeah. we're homeless. We moonlight sleeping on the midnight <laughs> Right, Sue, so, um, what about fundraising? Um, please speak to us about the art fix. Well, I'm currently fundraising coordinator for Alfred Studio. And my aims within this is that we want to be fundraising in a creative and different manner. So I've come up with this term called the Art Fix. Our first one is actually in Kuala Lumpur. We had an, the My Art Fix in Bangsa Shopping Centre. I hope some of you might have been there. And basically the purpose of it was to obviously fundraise for Orchid Studios project to Bolivia. Alongside that we also split the money on the day to give it to three local charities in KL. One was Shelter, the other one was Pusat Bantuan Sentul and another one was uh, Autistic Home which was in Johor Bahru. So through that we were able to bring out a couple of new young designers, like fashion designers, poets, artists, um, singers, people who I thought that they had a lot of talent and they could really have a use, they could really do with a platform to showcase their stuff. So the fashion designer's name is Carmen and she's currently studying business in London and I was really pleased because she told me that she went for London Fashion Week and she wanted to go in. You know how hard it is to get into London Fashion Week and they asked her for her business card and she showed them her business card and they googled her and all these images from the event in Bangsa Shopping Centre came out and they were like, oh! Yes, you can come into London Fashion Week. So it's another side of the charity to be able to promote local art because you know how hard it is in countries like ours to aspire to become creatives like designers, artists, poets, musicians. I'm sure many of you have had that problem that your parents are like, oh no, it's not a proper degree. You have to go study accountancy or doctor or medicine or law. Go become a lawyer or business or whatever. Nothing against those professions. But if you have a dream and if you have talent, we want to see these people really emerge in their fields and have an opportunity to explore their creativity. So that's what the Art Fix is about. So, future plans. <laughs> Basically, the next project, I'm really keen for it to be to take Orchid Studio to Malaysia because we've re received like huge amounts of support from there in terms of just support and fundraising and moral support as well. So, I've been scouting out for places, a potential site in maybe Sabah, Sarawak or even like anywhere in Malaysia. So if any of you have any ideas for me, any organizations you know that need a help, need a hand, need a building, need people to come in and help, I'm sure there are loads around, um, do contact us. So we'll give you our email addresses at the end. Um, yeah, that's our future plans. I've been to Sabah Sarawak. There are places off the coast in this island called Pulau Sangai where they don't have sewage systems, they don't have running water or electricity. I know that millions of babies getting dumped every year because there are moms who are either Indonesian or Malay women that haven't been married. They can't give their babies up for adoption, they can't get birth certificates. And all these Myanmar refugees, there are huge, huge potential in Malaysia to help. There's so much to do. So I know a lot of you will have some contacts, a lot of you will have causes that you want to help yourself. So please get involved if you want to. And um, yeah, just contact us on... You can check out our website. Orchidstudio.co.uk Orchid like in Malay. Orchid means orphan kids and studio refers to art and architecture studios. Um, whether we need help and stuff, um, definitely. Right now, Orchid Studio is going through um, just a business plan 
different perspective as we've gone through our next project, but um, we will definitely post up anything on the website asking people to come out, volunteer or volunteer in any ways that they can. So like we said, just get in contact with us. Um, yeah, our message that we want to send across to everyone. Just do it! <laughs> yeah, no. Yes, <laughs> no. we can! Yes, we can. But, um, yeah, no, it doesn't matter how young you are. If you have something that you're passionate about, um, use your skills to help others that can't help themselves. And, yeah. You're never too young. You're never too We're young. We're not young, but Malaysia bully. <laughs> Say Malaysia bully. Malaysia bully. <laughs> Contact Fong Wai or Michelle or Harris if you need to contact us. And have a good day. Hope you enjoyed our conversation.